여러분 안녕하세요. 저는 다니엘입니다. Uh, magandang araw po. Anyongasayo. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our public lecture today. I'm Michael Manahan from the UP Department of Linguistics, and I will be your moderator for today's UP Korea Research Center, UPKRC public lecture. A big welcome to everyone joining us. This lecture is one of the regular activities hosted by UPKRC, and we're hoping that our afternoon will be filled with new insights and knowledge for all of us. A quick introduction about the UP Korea Research Center. Back on April 27, 2016, the University of the Philippines, with the support of the Academy of Korean Studies, AKS Korean Studies Promotion Service, proudly launched the Korea Research Center with the goal of offering Filipino scholars and researchers a platform to dive deeper into Korean studies. UPKRC is envisioned as a space where students and professionals can engage in meaningful comparative research and foster collaborations between Korean and Philippine institutions. It's our hub for promoting Korean studies, sponsoring interdisciplinary research, and training the next wave of Koreanists in the country. Before we start the lecture, a few house rules. Please feel free to drop your questions and comments for our speaker in the comments section of our Facebook and YouTube live stream. We will address them during our open forum. Please keep in mind that this forum is a safe space. We will not tolerate any form of bullying or trolling, academic or otherwise. The organizer deserves the right to remove those who will create any disruption in any part of the program. And just a heads up, we're recording today's event. You can catch it later on the official UPKRC Facebook page and YouTube channel. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for, um, let's meet our guest speaker. Cassandra, or Aya de la Cruz, is an impressive figure in the world of translation. She's a graduate of the Literature Translation Institute of Korea's Advanced Media Translation course and the British Center for Literary Translation Summer School, both from this year, 2023. Aya wears many hats. She's a freelance translator and a passionate Korean language educator having taught at the King Sejong Institute in Quezon City and the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And excitingly, she will start her MA in Korean Language and Culture Education at Korea University under the GKS program next week. Let's give a warm welcome to Aya as she presents her lecture titled, Loss in Translation, Getting Started as a Korean Literary and Screen Translator. 네, 안녕하세요. So, thank you for the warm introduction, Sir Mike. Okay, so let me just put up my screen. Okay, so ayan again, uh, once again, thank you for the introduction, although an <laughs> impressive figure though, but I'm still working towards that. So, um, yes, I'm here to uh, talk about Korean translation and pursuing a career in this field. Pero kasi there are a lot of ano, types of translation kasi na you could get into. No? So specifically, today I'm going to um, focus on translating the kind of media you're seeing on the screen right now. So ano ba to mga to, no? So we have here yung webtoons, um, literature, rin yung mga Korean movies, and K-dramas. And there's something that they all have in common. So that is all of them are products of Hallyu or the Korean wave. So when I say Korean literary and screen translation, I am talking about itong, um, what we call K-translation. So ano pinagkaiba nito? How does this differ from just saying Korean translation? Ano ba yung sinisignify nung, nung K na to? Diba this capital letter K, we attach this to everything, like everything Hallyu. Kaya instead of Korean music, we say um, K-pop. So instead of Korean shows, we say K-drama or K-variety. And ganun din, likewise, instead of saying Korean movie, we say K-movie. So that K there kasi signifies something. So it's not just simply movie that is Korean or music that is Korean. Kaya it goes beyond even uh, media 
di ba, we also attach the key branding to other cultural exports related to Korean lifestyle that we see from these primary key products. For example, we have yung K-food. So, na-attach din natin yung K-branding there. We have yung K-fashion. And then we have the new K-beauty. So, given that, balik tayo sa meaning ng letter K na yun. So, what this K is signifying is yung different aspects of Korean culture that is marketed to foreigners. Bali, when we say, um, when we say K-drama, it's not just the show that's being exported, but also yung Korean culture na napakaloob sa content ng drama na yun. Kaya, going back to the concept of K-translation, what the K-branding here signifies is the transmission of Korean culture to the foreign market. So it's not just simply translating words, no? you're translating the culture as well. So it's a specific subset of the larger Korean translation, nasakop pati yung um, commercial translation, legal translation, um, medicine translation, or medical translation, and whatnot. So yung key translation, it's specific to the translation of Korean literature and cultural content. So on one hand, diba, we have yung traditional Korean, um, traditional written literature. So referring to those published in paper or in book format, whether it be prose or poetry. And then on the other hand, we have those categorized as cultural content consumed through screens. So we have yung, um, audiovisual media natin like shows, mga dramas, variety shows, and movies. And syempre kasama din dito yung mga tulad ng webtoons, yung web novels, which is literature that we consume through our screens. So now, if you're an aspiring, say, K-translator, that is, if you want to translate um, Korean literature and Korean cultural content, so what are the chances you could get into that market? Meron nga bang ano, high demand for K-translators that's separate from um, Korean commercial translators? Well, to give you an idea muna regarding the demand for K-translation, it's actually easy to visualize this demand because um, K-translation is not a new thing naman and it just reflects and follows the demand for Korean content outside Korea. So for example, here's a view of the number of Korean fiction, so novels translated and published overseas since 1996 when the Literature Translation Institute of Korea was founded. So if you notice, well, there are ups and downs throughout the years. The, gen the general trend reflects that of the Hali wave. So uptrend siya pataas. And this is only actually expected to continue going higher since K-literature compared to the other um, products of Hallyu has only recently been part of that K-wave movement. Then aside from that, obviously, we have yung K-drama and um, Korean movies. And it's actually easy to assume no, that the pandemic may have been the peak of K-drama and K-movies, especially with Netflix um, during uh, 2020, 2022. So, um, but actually, that was just the industry recording new heights. So, even Netflix, no, even up until this year, they are still highly positive on the continued boom of the Korean wave. And aside from these indicators, we've also seen an increase with Korean producers adopting the one-source multi-use strategy with Korean content. This is why, diba, we see a lot of Korean dramas based on webtoons or web novels like yung The Uncanny Counter or itong ano, All of Us Are Dead and recently yung ano sa business proposal or the other way around, no? like K-dramas like itong Extraordinary Attorney being adapted into webtoons as well. And it's not just limited to webtoons and K-dramas, of course. So we have Korean literature uh, that are getting adapted into movies as well, like yung the movie The Last Empress, um, Punch, The Christmas Carol, and when these adaptations happen, the original material gets attention as well, diba? So ending is, we have the same um, source material requiring translation as it gets adapted into different formats. So um, even if just one format gets popular overseas, nagkakaroon rin ng demand for the same material in another format. And we're just talking about different formats, no? Siyempre, iba pa yung um, sa different audiences dyan, such as when something requires translation into American English and then a different one naman for world English. Or let's say the translation of subtitles versus closed captions. So given this uh, no, increase in demand with Hallyu or itong K-translation, siyempre, we expect then that there are more opportunities in the field. But the problem is, it's actually not that obvious because 
it's quite difficult to get into that field or much less pursue a full-time career for those who are interested in really, I don't know, going to that. And this is much more true when it comes to literary translation. So um, it's difficult for various reasons, but for one, uh, it's not as simple as sending a resume and applying for a translator position, like your regular office job. So um, even if that's the case, where do you even send your resume, Diba? Or what should you even have in your resume? Or how do you know you're qualified and ready to be a translator? So actually, when we ask the question, who can be a key translator? But there's really no clear-cut answer to this. Because there's no standardized list of qualifications or requirements when it comes to being um, a screen or literary translation. And it's actually because of this, that's why it's difficult to get into key translation despite there being um, numerous opportunities. Naman. But if we could just pick out one thing that, um, let's say the one most important skill uh, a translator should have. So, what could it be kaya? Like yung pinaka basic or pinaka bare minimum talaga na all translators should have this. So, that's language skills. Meaning proficiency or com competency in the target language and source language. So, in this case, let's say Korean and English or if you're translating into Filipino, no, Korean and Filipino. So with just that, yes, you can start translating. You can be a key translator. You can be anything you want to be. So ayon, yes, that's the end of my talk. Char. <laughs> so of course, the quality of your translation will still, ano no, will still depend on other skills that you need to have. Pero at the point is, um, at the bare minimum, and you don't really need. It's not necessary na for you to have a degree in translation, or. Um, be officially certified by some institution to become a translator. Of course, meron din ganun, but again, hindi siya necessary. Unless, of course, you're doing legal or medical translation or you want to go full-time into commercial trans translation as well. Again, of course, there are other skills you need to have as well, but this is the most basic requirement one should have if you wish to be a key translator. So given that ano, yung language skills na yun is so important as a translator, does that mean you have to be a native speaker of either language you're working with? So do you have to be a native speaker of Korean? Do you have to be uh, a native speaker of English or Filipino? So actually, there are two opposing ano, no, sides to this. So on one hand, you have those believing in the mother tongue principle. So... What this states is that translators must translate into their mother tongue. So meaning, for example, a native speaker of English must translate into English, not into any other language. Native speaker of Filipino must translate into Filipino. So under this principle, can Filipinos translate into English? So based on this principle lang na. Actually, no. So we can't... um translate into English. We can translate Korean into English. So, kung ito yung standard na sinusunod sa industry, Filipinos can never be a key translator. Kasi, um, unless mother tongue natin ang, um, you're Filipino but mother tongue nyo is English, but most of um, Filipinos living in the Philippines, mother or English is not our mother tongue naman, di ba? And aside from that, we are actually not considered or recognized as native speakers according to the UK government, and also the Korean government. So both governments, they don't recognize the Philippines or the Filipinos as native speakers. The good thing is, um, itong mother tongue principle is rather outdated. So um, among translator communities, they don't actually adhere to this principle. That's why there are also the advocates of the idea under the Petra E framework that was launched in 2014 for literary translation education. So under this framework, one requirement is for, trans, uh, for translators to have competency in both their target language and source language. So for example, Korean and English or Korean, Korean and Filipino. So you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to be a native speaker so it says here that anyone can translate from and into any language with years of training or schooling in those two languages.
So under this framework, there are actually ano, lots of um, minakalista na skills that translators should have. And one of those is yung language competency nga. So um, you know, have to be a native speaker daw of either Korean or English as long as you have the minimum competence required for it. So following the this framework, a professional literary translator translating from Korean to English must at least be proficient in terms of topic 5 for reading in Korean and say for C2 or equivalent of that for reading and writing in English. So that is if you want to be a professional translator. No, Siyempre, if you're still ano, um, learning or nandung ka pa lang sa beginner or learner level, so it's ex it's not expected na nandung ka na naman sa level na yun. Now, the takeaway here is, so nakalagay, di ba, topic 5 for reading in Korea. Only your comprehension skill is actually important in the source language, so in Korean. So again, this is purely in terms of language skills. So we're going to be talking about the other skills later. So you don't necessarily have to be a fluent speaker, although that helps, because translation, again, is different from interpretation. Man. So you translate um, written text. So hindi siya interpretation. No? And you don't have to be a fluent writer, again, in Korean as well, because you won't write in that language. Man. You're translating into another language from Korean to English or Korean to Filipino. So ang pinaka-important is your understanding of that source language. As for the language you're translating into, English or Filipino, it goes now you must be able to write well in it then. Now, going back to the question I posed a while ago, let's go one step further and rephrase this. Because it's not just language skills you have to hone, diba? This is why not all native speakers are necessarily good translators. Kasi kung language skills na naman ang kailangan natin, then the best um, people for the role of translators would be bilinguals, no? Yung mga bilinguals who have, ano no, who are native speakers of both the target and source language. But that is not the case naman lagi. So let's ask instead, what skills should a translator have? So I asked my um, network of literary and screen translators what kind of knowledge or skills are required but to translate a book or to translate subtitles effectively. Well, as expected, I don't know, everyone gave different answers kasi, syempre, iba-iba ng style to, iba-iba ng um, opinions regarding translation. However, all of them agree that their profession, pagta-translate, involves many different skills. And to give the four uh, most common ones, so we have yung language skills that uh, I mentioned a while ago. And second most common na nabanggit was yung cultural understanding. So for example, knowing how certain concepts mean and came to be in the context of Korean culture and anong equivalent nun in English. So next, another one is creative writing. So whether you're doing literary translato, uh, translation or screen translation, there are various um, cultural and technical constraints that you have to work around with, diba? So being a good writer will help you navigate that. And being a good writer will also be able to help you make your translation sound more, quote unquote, natural to your target audience. So pagdating sa commercial um, translation, creative writing is not a necessary skill. But when it comes to literary or screen translation, creative writing is one of the most um, highly sought out skills that when it comes to translation. And lastly, research. Because even if you're a native Korean speaker, let's say you're good at everything then. Okay, okay language skills mo, cultural understanding, creative writing. But you're not always 100% knowledgeable about everything in Korean culture naman. And what if you're working, let's say, on material that covers a lot of topics that you're unfamiliar with. Let's say, like working on a historical fiction novel or a medical drama. So you really have to know how to do research and use whatever tools you have at your disposal. So hindi pwedeng ano lang na. Hindi pwedeng um, basta fluent ako sa Korean, fluent ako sa English, okay na to. So dapat marunong din tayo mag-research. So now let's say you have these skills na and you're ready. But 
you don't know where to start or maybe you're not ready yet and want to hone these skills first. So again, where do you start? Kaya sabi ko kanina, no, um, it's difficult to get into tong K-translation even if there's a lot of opportunities out there kasi mahirap din maghanap ng opportunities na yan. So there are actually um, several direct paths to K-translation and I'll talk about the four most common ones. So first is um, through formal education. So for aspiring translators who are also interested in research, commercial translation, and or interpretation, this is um, the most recommended track. So mamaya, I will we'll we'll be going through each of these tracks one by one. And next, undertaking professional training. So this is for mostly for aspiring and emerging translators in the fields of literary and screen translation. So when you say aspiring translator, at yung mga translators na um, nasa beginner or learner level pa lang, so wala pa talagang experience, no experience yet. And when you say emerging translator, we're talking about translators who have not published more than one full-length work. So let's say mga translators na may experience translating um, short stories or contributing to magazines, pero wala pa talagang experience translating an entire movie, um, an entire novel. So that's what we ano, call emerging translators. And then showcasing. So showcasing, this is recommended for um, aspiring translators in the field of literary translation, although applicable din to sa screen translation. And then last is freelancing. So for aspiring translators naman in the field of screen translation. Okay, first sa formal education. So edo actually pinaka time consuming kasi this refers to ano, getting a higher um, getting higher education in relevant fields such as translation studies, language studies, or linguistics. And in the case of literary translators, Pwede rin yung comparative literature or creative writing. So for this one, um, again, kanina sabi ko, no, it's not necessary na you have to get a degree in translation studies or relevant fields. Kasi um, there are other paths to translation that you could venture into. So actually, most of the um, established popular translators in Korean to English fiction, mga full-time translators actually, Talaga. They don't have a degree in these majors. So, meron sa kanila nag major in philosophy, major in law, major in medicine. So, hindi naman talaga siya required. But it helps nga kanina, like I said, if you're interested as well in interpretation or commercial translation and other fields of translation. Now, if you want more practical training that focuses on the very specific medium you want to work on, like gusto mo sa ano ka lang, literary translation, or you want to just um, focus on translating webtoons or Korean movies, k dramas. So joining professional programs, training programs is the most effective. Um, I'm not sure about other languages, but in the case of Korean, thankfully, the Korean government provides a lot of funding talaga for translation training programs. So there's a lot of opportunities out there for anyone who wants to get started into Korean um, key translation without going through any formal education. So for example, sa LTI Korea, we have um, two main courses, yung regular course nila, which is a two-year program. So similar sa master's program, except... Um, ang focus talaga is practical, on practical translation, like building portfolio, building your network, um, experience, workshopping, all that. So, um, again, this is fully funded by the Korean government. So, you also have, um, aside from getting free tuition, you also get monthly stipend by joining this course. And ayun, you have the opportunity to join exclusive workshops, seminars, internships, even after you complete the course. So applications is usually around March or April. So that's once a year. But let's see, two, year, two years is a long time. So pero wala kayong ano no. Don't have the luxury to go to that um, two-year training program. So there's also the night course. So the night course naman is a one-year program with classes held online once a week. So target nito usually is yung mga um, may day jobs. 
So same as the regular course, you will also get the opportunity to join exclusive workshop seminars. And something exclusive to this, the night course is you exclusive one-on-one -on -one mentorships with established um, translators. So this one, naman, applications is a bit early, so earlier, so January, around January to February. And aside from itong sa LTI Korea, there are also training opportunities available in the UK and US. So in the case of UK, so it's UK, but this is also funded by the Korean government. So there is the British Center for Literary Translation. They, they have a literary translation summer school with tracks on um, translation and also creative writing. So unlike LTI Korea, where you can where the, the language you could, you're going to work on is limited. So Korean to English lang siya, walang Korean to Filipino. Dito sa BCLT, they have a track for Korean to Filipino or Korean to any other language. So this is great if you want to focus on or get training in Korean to Filipino key translation. So aside from that, the summer school is also good for network building opportunities because the, the people who apply to the summer school are usually most of the time, mga established translators na talaga. So applications naman nito is around January or February if you're interested. And another one, also based in UK, is the National Center for Writing. So National Center for Writing, they have um, a six-month emerging translator mentorship. So again, when we say emerging translator, anyone, any translator, aspiring translator, have not published more than one full-length work. So they have a six-month personal mentoring program, and it's held online. So this is also great for those who can't leave the country. But if you if you like um, if you need to meet your mentor in person or attend events, then they will provide a stipend or funding for that naman. So the good thing about this is, aside from receiving mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, you will also get the chance to have your translation output published as part of an anthology. So applications, July to August. So ayun diba, there's a lot. And then, ito naman based in the US. So the American Literary Translators Association. So it's also a mentorship. This one stands for a year naman. So it's similar to the mentorship from NCW, which is held online and will also be given a stipend if you need to travel. And your output will be included in a reading at the annual Alta Conference. So ayun, there's a lot of this actually. So aside from what I mentioned, there's more. Ito lang yung pinaka major. So there is even one specific for dubbing, Korean to English dubbing, which is hosted by the KBS Broadcasting Academy. So if you're interested in dubbing, you can look that up. And you know, again, like I mentioned a while ago, one of the most important skills that translators should have is research. So you just look around, um, utilize the tools you have there, the internet. You could actually find a lot of these opportunities available out there at no cost. So free, funded pa nga, may stipend pa. So parang ikaw pa yung babayaran to like study translation, train in translation. So... Aside from um, to mga professional training na yun, say, wala talaga kayong time for those. You can also showcase your work. So how do you do that? So one option is to join translation competitions to get your portfolio piece published. So for example, there's the Translation Award for Aspiring Translators by LTI Korea. So the pro here, pros here is you get a reason to work for a portfolio piece and at the same time have a chance to get it published. So very important you have something published, no? Because that's what you can put on your resume and what, that's what you can show prospect clients. So when it does, it gets your name out there then and opportunities will just come to you without you even looking for it. So another one is itong um, Modern Korean Literature Translation Award. So these are held annually. So if you're interested, like you have nothing to lose naman, diba, by joining these, ano, these competitions. And bonus na nga rin yung, you can build a portfolio pa. So aside from that, you can also contribute to, um, join and contribute to translator collectives. So translator collectives, this refers to groups of translators working in your language pair. And they usually host workshopping sessions, portfolio exchanges, and opportunities to contribute to anthologies for publishing. 
So an example here is etong Chogwazin. So Chogwazin is a collective that works on Korean poetry. So this is um, one of the most popular collect collectives if you're interested in Korean to English poetry. Now, there are three major ones for Korean to English ran by established translators. So, itong mga translator collectives na to, translator groups, this is really a great way to build your network and experience. But the thing is, these groups are by invite only, by invitation only. So, I can't really disclose the invitation here in the public lecture, but hindi naman sila closed off. They're not very secretive naman. And itong mga collectives na to, it's open to anyone. So, we really just have to, ano na, make an effort into in touch with those people who run such groups. So how can you find them? Go on social media. Go on Twitter. Look for the social media accounts of popular translators. Most of them have a Twitter account. Go follow them and um, talk to them. Kasi hindi naman sila, hindi naman sila, ano, um, tag dito, tipong mga idols, Korean idols na hindi kayo pinapansin pag kinakausap kayo. So just talk to them on social media, ask them about these collectives, and they will actually send you an invite to this. So ayun, if you're interested in joining these collectives, get in touch with those translators on social media. And lastly, freelancing. So freelancing is actually the easiest, most common, most obvious entry path for screen translators, mostly screen translators without formal education or professional training. So aside from translator roles, meron din freelance as a proofreader or editor muna. So um, freelancing, this is, this is itong pinaka similar sa ano, like the, the act of sending a resume to a certain company to get a certain role. So that's why this is the most easiest and most common, I'd say. Kasi the others I mentioned, they, you really need to put in a lot of effort. But the thing with freelancing is, as much as it is easy, there is a lot of, or there's high competition then sa path na to. So you're not just competing with aspiring translators, you're competing with those who have experience now. You're competing with language experts. So ayun, I've mentioned those four paths into getting in K-translation. Okay, now, ano yung mga challenges that we may encounter well, um, trying to pursue a career in this field. So again, challenges into getting in translations. I'm not going to be talking about ano muna, no? challenges with translation itself because that's another topic for another day. But one is yung getting bias from or getting bias against yung bias against non-native speakers. So for example, us, like tayo, Filipinos, for Filipinos. So my bias against um, Filipinos who are trying to venture into K-translation kasi we are neither a native speaker of Korean and English naman. At least we're not considered native speakers by the Korean government or the UK government. So um, mga tula dating non-native speakers, we often face skepticism regarding our language skills kahit naman Ayun, we have proof that we're proficient, that we can do this, that we experience din tayo. And this is evident with agencies or publishers that um, may tendency to list being a native speaker as a requirement for certain translation projects. So may mga ganun, makita kayo sa list of requirements nila, nakalagay, must be a native speaker. Or going further, meron ding must be a citizen of a certain country. Ganun. So, ayun, aside from that, syempre, skepticism is also faced from readers or audiences. But, ayun, while native speakers tend to have an advantage due to their familiarity with one or both languages, having um, a better command of the language does not necessarily mean that they are better at producing translators that are correct, faithful, or cultural sensitive and accurate. So, ayun, for Filipinos without any related background, or experience or any kind of education who has part to translate Korean into English, you must really have to put in extra time and effort when it comes to building a portfolio. If let's say, even, even if okay ka naman sa language skills mo. Now, another one is securing projects as an aspiring translator. So 
um, clients and agencies often seek translators with established reputation already or relevant experience. So it's very difficult for newcomers to enter the field. Um, another common practice in the industry is passing over projects to co-translators through referrals. So um, there's a disadvantage for those who are not part of a certain network or a collective. So for aspiring translators, you really have to be proactive in seeking out opportunities. So hindi pa din ka, na naghihintay ka lang no, for an opportunity to come to you. You really have to go out there and contact um, agencies, publishers, clients. Actually, for me, this was the toughest one because I graduated with a business administration degree, no other experience, no network. And I'm also a non-native speaker. So when I started out, um, yeah, when, during my first year starting out, trying to land a job, like I, I really wasn't able to get any project. I only started getting projects when I went into LTI Korea. So this is also true pala, um, in some cases for those with experience. Kaya there's not much full-time translators working on screen translation and literary translation. So most of the translators in the field ay puro part-time or ginagawang racket-racket lang kasi ayun, mahirap ngang makakuha ng um, parang security as a full-time translator in this um, field. And lastly, so as for me, I, I um, most of my, all, all or most of my experience are with Korean to English translation. So the reason for that is because there is um, not much opportunities then when it comes to Korean to Filipino K translation. So even though there are more and more Korean content being translated into Filipino, um, the entry barrier is still high for those who wish to pursue this one. Because this is due to the prevalence of a uh, relay translation where instead of translating directly from Korean to English, ang nangyari is um, mas preferred yung tinatranslate na lang yung English na into Korean. Now, this is good news for those who want to work in key translation, pero hindi proficient in Korean. Um, especially with how recently sa, I think sa VIU yata yan, they've been putting out old key dramas with Filipino subtitles or dubbed in Filipino. Pero ang nangyayari doon, again, is kinukuha lang yung nakadub na or subtitles in English, tapos tsaka tinatranslate in Filipino. So ayon, still with that said, there are a lot of um, there are existing opportunities naman. It's just that we've still got a long way before we open more of those to aspiring translators, um, yung mga newcomers. Because syempre, since etong Korean to Filipino translation market is still relatively small and new in terms of the demand, then so um, syempre, most companies prefer established translators, those with experience in another language pair or those who are considered language experts na, like educators or those in the academe. But since we Filipinos pride ourselves in being multilingual, we can also just work muna from Korean to English where there are much more opportunities and start with that muna. So ayun, if you're interested in Korean to Filipino hate translation, I recommend starting with Korean to English muna unless you already like have a network with that. So, ayan, um, that's it. If you're interested in pursuing a, key, a career in K-Translation, I hope I was able to shed some light on how you can get started. So, thank you for listening. Yun. Uh, maraming salamat, Aya, for sharing your presentation with us. I'm sure marami kaming natutunan no, dun sa mga uh, shiner mo para uh, mag-venture into the world of K-Translation. And um, for our audience, no, um, na nakikinig at nanonood, um, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to post them on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And then, um, try namin, or try, nam, try sagutin ng ating resource speaker yung mga uh, questions niyo or address yung mga comments na meron kayo. Okay? Ayan. Um, siguro, uh, ako... Personally, I'm interested, no, Aya, kung paano, nabanggit mo na business administration graduate ka, so paano yung entry path mo? So, um, you want to share more about your experience, no, pagpasok into K-Translation? Mm. Actually, sa entry path for me, um, I mentioned yung apat kanina, no, although it's not limited to that naman. 
it's not mutually exclusive naman. Like, you can venture in all paths all at the same time. So, that's what I did actually. Sa sobrang dami ko ng time, <laughs> I ventured into all paths at the same time. Um, but ayun, iba-iba ang kanilang ano rin. Um, mahirap siya i-juggle. And you really have, I think, you really have to know muna which one you want to do. But like, do you want to focus on literature ba? Or do you want to focus on screen, screen translation? Kasi by, by um, focusing on this one specialty, mas focus ka on your training, on your education, and you'll be able to land more opportunities on that specific field. So um, for me personally, ang naging effective din is yung sa um, joining professional training. So specifically yung sa LTI Korea and yung sa BCLT. Kasi with those, not only was I able to build, create my portfolio, I was also able to like connect with fellow translators. And anong nangyayari yung mga translators na yun, when they get a project, parang binibigay na lang nila sa akin, especially if they have their hands full already. So very important din talaga nung ano, aside from studying, education, yung network. And yung sa... Um, yung experience mo, Aya, is both sa literary translation and screen translation. Tama ba? Yes, sir. Um, um, can you share your um, mga projects? Kahit hindi yung specific titles, baka hindi pwede yung disclose. No? Um, how was your experience translating literary um, material tapos screen translation? May difference? Um, or... Actually, medyo ano rin. Parang... Pag pinagsabay mo sila, medyo parang nagkakaroon ka ng exten- existential crisis kasi sobrang iba ng, ibang iba yung approach na you have to adopt when it comes to literary translation versus screen translation. Kasi pagdating sa literary, uh, screen translation, you have a lot of technical constraints. Eh. Like, um, you have to be wary of your, ano, yung, yung space constraints, time constraints, yung readability and all that. Kasi when you're, let's say, when you're when the audience is watching a K-drama, yung attention nila is nasa nangyayari sa ano, nangyayari sa screen, yung subtitles, and then yung audio input then So, ang daming nangyayari. All that within a short time frame. So, we have to make sure yung, um, ang nangyayari, alim, mas nagiging importante yung readability as opposed to accuracy. Although, important naman sila both. But may um, certain aspect na mas ang at dapat yung readability. And when it comes to ano naman literature, when your say target audience mo nagbabasa ng lang ng libro, focus nila is nasa ano lang talaga. Nandoon lang talaga sa binabasa nila. So walang um walang ibang image unless graphic novel din, but mostly just the words, the content of that book. So um you have a lot of there's more freedom. There's more um can put on more creativity when it comes to translating literary translation kasi wala rin naman space constraints and um ang expectation is yung audience yung nagbabasa yung reader if there's something that they can't understand ano kunare if you use a korean term as is like just romanizing it okay lang pagdating sa literary translation kasi your reader can just look it up by pause from and whatever they're reading but pagdating sa screen translation, hindi naman mayat maya na pwedeng mag-post yung ano, di ba? Yung mga, yung nanonood. Nangyari, ang, ang tendency is nanonood lang talaga ng k-drama, k- k-movie in one sitting. So, may ganun. So, magkaiba yung challenges ng dalawa. And yung translator, um, talagang dapat uh, meron siyang uh, magandang sense no ng pagjudge kung alin ba lalo na sa screen translation alin ba dito yung idadagdag ko ibabawas ko to fit into the time constraint no yung technical constraints no let's say dun sa subtitling all right i think meron tayong mga um, questions na dito sa ating um, this is from youtube no so uh, from professor kong minbe uh, during your training at LTI, was there any interaction with other language aside from English na trainings? What were your observations when it comes to KL other FL trans- KL to other foreign language translation? Okay, so thank you, Dal. 
Yeah. Okay, so yes, during my training at LTI, although um classes were mostly among ourselves, like see, si, ano, from those with those translating into English, we also had interactions with those from other classes, those translating into um Vietnamese, German, and French. I think um one observation is pagdating sa Asian languages like Japanese, um, Vietnamese. There's a tendency for the translators in or the trainees from that program to adopt a more say literal translation, like being faithful talaga to the language, as opposed to the um, those translating in Western language or, for example, in French, German, English. Um, there's a more tendency to adopt a more liberal approach. So, um, parang instead of faithfulness to the source language, ang yah is faithful faithfulness to the text itself. So may ganong ano. I'm not sure if that's for all cases. So bakit nito pa na research? But yun that's one observation I had. Mm, see. All right. So um, let's try to answer another uh, questions from um, Jap Jap Fernandez de Leon. Uh, hello, pa. Thank you very much from for the insightful talk. While listening, a few questions came to mind. First, when deciding where to study postgraduate programs, I've heard some people suggest that finding a research professor you would like to study under comes first and the institution comes second. Does this advice hold water? And then, how is it for a translation program? So, kain mo na natin sa kita yung first. So, study professor. Finding a research mm. professor first. Then the um actually this depends if ano ba yung goal mo for getting into the postgraduate program like is it because you want to like pursue a career talaga as a full-time translator or are you interested more into the research aspect of it kasi if you kung ang goal mo is for for the advancement of your career I'd say institution comes first. Kasi as I mentioned a while ago, sobrang importante nung network building. So if the institution, if, if ang, ang goal mo is to really get a full-time career there, then you'd want to build your network first. And kung research, research naman, focus mo is on research on the academe, you want to stay in the academe, then um, I'd say you should prioritize yung study muna when it comes to finding a research professor. So ayun. Um, but when it comes to post-credit programs, no, I I I won't name drop, but <laughs> sab um from from um one of the most estab one of the most popular um Korean to English fiction translators in in the recent decade. Um if you want to pursue a career in translation, do not go into postgraduate programs. <laughs> So why? Because the more uh, theoretical. If you want to um, focus on the practical aspect, talaga, go into training programs. So ayon, kayo narin bahala magasa. Depende rin kung ano kasi gusto niya. So you need to research, no? Kung ano yung mga programs or available uh, workshops or training programs na pwede para sa atin. And then I think may isa pang question si. Jap Jap Kanina, no? During your stay at the Korean Language Institute and BCLT, what were mm -hmm. some challenges that you experienced now? Uh, challenges that I experienced. So actually, both at LTI and BCLT, I was the only non-native speaker. So, lahat sila, either native speaker ng Korean, so Koreans talaga, or Korean-American, Korean-British, or whatnot. So, um, native speaker of English and Korean. So, as a non-native speaker, I felt some limitations talaga on my part when it comes to, let's say, um, kunwari, we're, we're looking at a certain text. We're workshopping it on the spot. Mahirap sa akin gawin yung on-the-spot translation as opposed to my, ano, my peers. Although, kasama na din kasi yung experience sila, pero on my part, I'd say even if I had more experience, Mahirapan pa rin talaga ako sa on-the-spot translation. So I'd say I rely a lot on tools, resources that are available to me as a non-native translator to help me sa mga, ano, mga concepts, mga bagay na hindi ko naintindihan in Korean. And speaking of tools and resources, ano ba yung mga 
naging invaluable tayo ng mga tools para sa, sa dito sa ano mo, sa translation journey mo. Um, okay, so major recent lang, I'm, I'm ano na, an emerging translator lang din. Major recent lang din yung start ng career ko. So, this may be controversial, but one invaluable tool is yung chat GPT. So, okay, I'm sure you're all familiar with ChatGPT with AI. So, I use that tool not to like translate things for me, but I use that tool parang as an alternative to Google. Like if I want to look up synonyms, um idiomatic expressions that I know I know how to describe this idiomatic expression, pero I can't quite um remember ko ano yung naiisip ko na yun. So, I use ChatGPT to help me with that. So, if you know kasi how to use that properly, then it's really a great tool to have and it's not going away anytime soon naman. It will just keep on improving, so might as well know how to use it and ayun, be able to utilize it in your line of work. Okay. And, all right, and may isa tayong question from Sir Mark de Chavez um, regarding source material topic. Are there topics that you try to avoid and what is your process when you get a material that is not very familiar to you? Mm, okay. So, um, during my um, stint as a freelance webtoon translator, so pagdating sa ano, freelancing kasi most of the time, you don't really have the chance to choose kung anong gusto mong ano, no, translate what material you want to work with. So, there were... Um, I was given some webtoons na ang, that falls under the um tawag dito. Medyo may triggering content. So yung mga ganong klaseng content. Um pagdating sa ganun, I, I I really can't avoid it naman no kasi um that comes with the work then. So what I do is like try my parang look up similar material that are medyo ano medyo tamed down toned down and then i will start with that tapos saka ako parang magsisimula magwork doon sa ano nabigay sa akin although it takes a lot of time takes a lot of preparation talaga but ayun it's it's the same kanina with what i said na if you're not a non native if you're not a native speaker you have to put in more effort so ganito din if you're working on a material that you're not familiar with or yung ayaw mo you have to put in more effort okay and Hello, kung ayaw mo siguro yung materia, no? for some reason, uh, kailangan maghanap ka ng mag-sustain ang interest mo dun sa material. Kasi to give justice din, no? I think, dun sa material, para dun sa quality, hindi affected masyado yung quality ng um, translation. Okay. Yun. And um, next is from GKS Philippines Alumni Association. Uh, thank you, UPKRC and Aya, for this very informative public lecture. Um, curious now, a uh, program supported by Korean government. Does the program require applicants to have Korean fluency before applying, or is it okay to learn while doing the program? Asking for those na hindi pa talaga fluent, pero gusto mag-venture sa pagiging translator. Okay, so um, actually, sa, when you're applying for these programs, hindi sila nagre-require ng topic, topic certificate, or like you have to major, have majored in Korean language or nagtika ng Korean language classes. Um, what they look at is yung sample translation mo and yung sagot mo sa essays which have to be in Korean. So since you have to write those essays in Korean, you have to write your application in Korean, you have to at least be able to write in Korean. So you don't really have to have native level um, fluency. But Ayun, um, it depends on the strength of your ano rin kasi, your motivations pagdating sa essay. Yung sa sample mo, yung um, kung gaano ka ganda yung quality ng sample mo written in English or Filipino rather than sa Korean. And do you have any idea kung gaano, kung ano bang classes yung kailangan or anong level ba yung dapat para siguro mag-attempt no, to join a program? Actually, ang mindset ko is even if film mo hindi ka ready, just try it. Just attempt to do it. Kasi you won't lose anything naman eh. Um, for example, sa, sa cohort ko in LTI Korea, meron sa amin na topic level 3 lang siya. So medyo, you'd, you'd think na medyo bababa yun. Pero she made it there. Um, she was able to graduate from the course. And that's because naisipan niya lang mag-apply. Kahit di talaga siya 100% confident sa skills niya. 
So, okay. Um, other questions from JM Super Cute. Do you also find yourself competing for projects with other translators who are considered native English speakers or with other Filipinos? Okay, so... Or do you get um, translation? Yeah. Sorry. Or do you, I mean, so may follow-up question, I think. Or do you get translation projects mainly geared to Filipino readers or audience? So, my own question. Um, I don't think, yeah, I've never gotten a project that's geared towards Filipino readers or audience, but mostly is um, geared towards the ano, global audience, so world English ang, ang, lang, ang target language. So with that, syempre, mas competitive din kasi ang kalaban mo is all aspiring key translators around the world. <laughs> So um there are a lot of cases talaga na nag-apply ako or um I wanted to pursue this certain project pero nabigay sa ano ibang translator na more experienced than me or more suitable although hindi na sila nag-elaborate so ano sabi ng suitable na yan pero ayun there are definitely a lot of cases na um I ha- I've had to compete with others then Usually, ano, interested lang ako, yung mga material na tinatanslate mo, usually, gaano katagal ka nag-work on, let's say, a movie ba? Or a um, webtoon? Um, let's see. Ano katagal I... yung runtime? Um, for webtoons, I usually depend sa ano genre. But, one hour to two hours per episode. So, per episode, per chapter, depende sa length. So, kung medyo parang yung comedy genre na medyo maikli lang talaga, it could be less than that. And as for movies or K-dramas naman, let's say, 40 to one hour. Um, Isang episode, I usually do it within a week. Although I don't, I'm not the type kasi to sit on like, a certain project, like finish it in one sitting. So it usually takes me a week. And one consideration is yung deadline. So kung medyo gipit sa deadline ko, hindi mong kinabukasan, hindi gagawin ko within the day ka na. <laughs> yes, deadline. <laughs> Minsan yung deadline affects <laughs> translation. Ay. Yung gano'ng kakabilis. Also the quality, no? Minsan naglalabas tayo ng, ng output natin. Tapos because of the deadline, well, pag pinanood mo ulit or binasa mo ulit, parang, ay, kailangan ko pa pala na, ay, may mas maganda pa pala ako biglang naisip no, na translation for that. Pero hindi na magbabago. <laughs> Ayan. Right. Um, next question um, from Camila Loyola. Have you had any experience in translating a Korean concept, culture, and neologism that was very significant to the text or plot but is non-existing in English? If yes, how were you able to translate this and what were the things you considered in doing so? Um, okay, uh, from this one webtoon, and actually, webtoon siya, tsaka Korean movie then, ano, K-drama, sorry, movie, uh, K-drama and webtoon na um, it's based on, ang setting is a school, so school setting siya about mga tinatawag na iljin or delinquents. So in that kind of material, um, sobrang daming concepts na very um, dito, specific to Korean culture. Like for example, the concept of yung ilgin delinquents. Kasi delinquents, when you say that, parang mga tawag dito, hindi sumusunod sa teachers, ganon. Pero when you look at it at the concept of ng web to name or k-drama na yun, may kinds of delinquents na rough lang magsalita, merong mga tipong violente lang talaga. So, wala talagang equivalent concept in English. So, pag ganun, ang ginagawa ko, I don't rely on um, one is one-to-one translation. What I do is, I come up with several terms, let's see, several terms, phrases for that concept. And among those na nasa list ko, kinuha ko ano man yung applicable for that certain scene. Kasi may mga cases na one term among the list is not applicable in a certain scene. Pero may mga cases naman applicable siya. So I keep um, a bunch of this parang terminology terminology list, parang isang Excel sheets, sheet siya, which um, where I list yung mga untranslatable Korean concepts. 
Right. Um, another question from, uh, again, from Professor Kyung Min Be. Um, what are you personally reading books, webtoons these days to continue daily practice or learning in Korean or English or Filipino? Um, these days, I'm translate. I trans. I'm reading mga translated materials in English. Mm. For example, um, the the Korean novel Whale or the ano uh, the recently published um Welcome to the Hyunnam Dong Bookstore or Bookshop. So, parang I'm focusing on translating. I reading translated work without looking at the source text. Kasi parang I want to like parang figure out what makes a good writer ba ano and ano paano ko ba ano ba yung mga indicators na um a good translator is a good writer or paano ba yung mga el, paano ko ba masasabi na or when ko ba masasabi na this one is a good book na i can tell na oh parang hindi to translated work so kaya i'm focusing on reading just tra- the translated um translated materials as opposed to in those in korean Okay. Um, yes, no. I think if you get to um, read other or view other uh, writers' works, no, translators' works, na it would also, in a way, expand no, yung pagtingin mo, perspective mo. Halimbawa, sa linguistic strategies, ah, ganito pala yung pwedeng gawin dito sa ganitong klase ng um, translation, no? yung mga challenges na na-encounter na ito. Um, all right, meron pa ba tayong questions? Ayan, so meron tayong questions. Uh, may question, are there any common misconceptions about the field of translation that you'd like to address? Meron bang misconception sa mga translators, translation? Um, I think na na mention is late din kanina, pero the ano, when you're into when you have a lot of experience in let's say commercial translation, parang may thinking na, okay, you can do ano rin siguro, k-drama translation. Siguro you will do well in Korean movie translation or you will do well in literary translation. Pero each of these, kasi iba-iba ng audience, iba-iba ng format, iba-iba ng strategies na you need to adopt, parang just because you have a lot of experience in one certain field of translation doesn't mean na um, parang you can do well na agad or you can use the same strategies you use in one, in the other. And hindi lang siya between different formats. For example, in the case of movies, let's say sanay ka with translating movies, um, tra- sanay ka with translating, working on indie movies, movies that are made for film festivals. It's not necessarily na you would do well pagdating sa commercial translation ng ano, Korean movies, like translating, let's say, under Netflix. Kasi sa Netflix, they really adhere to a very specific ano, no, mga style guide nila. So, just because okay yung language skills mo, okay yung cultural understanding mo, hindi siya ano, okay din yung research skills mo. Kailangan mo pa rin ng certain parang training para, maka, um, para maka-adapt ka dun sa gawain nung Netflix. So, kasi minsan may mga halimbawa for streaming platforms, may kanya-kanya silang style guide no, na mm-hmm. iba. Marahil dun sa iba pang forms ng um, screen, uh, screen translation or audiovisual translation. Um, question um, from Sir Alden Lee. Uh, thank you for the insightful talk, Aya. Are there layers of review in K-translation? Who does the review or who clears the translation before it gets rendered upon the material? Um, for this one, I think case-to-case basis siya, depende sa, sa platform, sa company, or sa publisher. Kasi, let's say, gipit na gipit talaga sa hours, or gipit yung deadline. May, may mga cases na you just have the first draft, may titingin nun to proofread, edit, and yun na yun, publish na. Pero, um, yung ano talaga, pinaka tag dito, Um, sinusubukan talaga sundin ng lahat, standardize, is yung after the first draft, pupunta sa editor, or kung may proofreader pang iba, tapos babalik ulit 
sa sa ano sa translator kasi titignan niya yung ano yung comments nung ano nung editor or proofreader and then um kung may na miss siya or may gusto siyang i-argue doon sa kinomit nung ano nung no proofreader editor then they will leave comments or just adopt or just ano uh, apply that comment and then again babalik doon sa ano proofreader or editor so depende sa time kasi and sa scope ng project So, kung you have a lot of time, may case na dumabot ng three rounds. I, I've, I've had that case. Pagdating naman sa webtoons, um, I've never had a work that I submitted come back to me. Kasi pagdating sa webtoons, once I submit it, may titingin na editor, lalapat ng, ano, lalapat ng typesetter, and then it gets published na. Never na bumabalik sa akin. Ganun din with key dramas. Ang na-experience ko na may bumabalik sa akin is, sa literature and movies. Yung those that takes a lot of time to work on. Okay. And in some, I think in some companies, um, streaming platforms means, uh, especially when high profile yung material na i-release na, yan talaga kailangan dumaan no? sa mga maraming director checking. At minsan, yung iba naman kung hindi high profile, minsan hindi dumadaan sa pag-check or minsan after na ma-release yung material, saka pa lang siya dadaan doon sa proseso ng pag-check and then doon pa lang siya eventually ma-revise. So may mga ganun. So tama yung sinabi ni Ari na minsan case-to-case basis or iba-ibang scenario yung nangyayari when it comes to checking no? the quality of the translation per company, per material, and so on. Alright. Um... Meron tayong question from um, MD. Any tips you can share for those wanting to apply to LTI? Um, tips for those wanting to apply for LTI. So, there are three rounds to the application. So, first, you have the um, yung sa documents mo, magsasabit ng documents, personal documents, and yung essay. And then, you have the the um, translation test, and then the interview. So, um, kailangan mo talaga magpaano, pabibo dun sa first stage pa lang, yun sa essays mo. You have to sound desperate. You have to be concrete sa goals mo. Like, after this, what do you want to do? Like, um, dapat hindi lang pwedeng like, I want to be a translator. Parang, ano, after, after the, the program, I want to work on this title, on this project. I want to work with this company. So very, be very specific. Add timelines if you can, and show that you really want to be, you know, to to join that program. So um, after you get through that, you have the translation test and interview. For those, no man, you just have to be you, because again, don talaga sa first stage yung ano, talagang competitive. Okay. Thank you, Aya. And nag-share din yung UP Korea Research Center ng links no, para doon sa um, LTI application, Translation Academy. Okay. Um, right. I think wala na tayong questions from our audience. Pero if you still have questions, you can email UPKRC and then UPKRC will direct you. I will forward your email to Aya. And right, um, so uh, sa ngayon, we would like to thank Ms. Aya de la Cruz for sharing your knowledge and experiences as well as your expertise with us in the field of translation at to the honor committee to sa UPKRC to have had you as our speaker for today. Um, I think we're going to show the certificate of attendance. All right. So, um, basahin ko na lang, no? the Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Cassandra de la Cruz for serving as a speaker at the 2023 UPKRC Public Lecture Loss in Translation, Getting Started as a Korean Literary and Screen Translator, held at the University of the Philippines, Quezon City, on this ninth day of September 2023, signed Director Kyung Min Be of the UP Korea Research Center. Maraming salamat. Uh, 
Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And for everyone who joined us today and would like to claim a certificate of attendance, please check out the link that will be displayed on your screen or that is displayed on your screen. Ngayon, no? And please be reminded that the link will only be active until 5 p.m. today. So, uh, magkalimutang i-fill out na yung evaluation link para doon sa hingi no, ng certificate of attendance. So, again, a virtual round of applause to Aya. And with that, we formally conclude today's UPKRC public lecture. Maraming salamat po. Kamsahamnida. Kamsahamnida.